This morning we are considering another story that may cause us either to seek a way to suspend our tendency to disbelieve the miraculous, or else to simply explain it away as an allegory. Listen now to our well-known text for this eighth Sunday after Pentecost from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Every time I read this story, I am reminded of a faithful old churchman who claimed that he had no problem believing any of the Bible, but that this particular story he felt just could not possibly have happened. And I suppose that's certainly one way to look at it. After all, based on much of our own experience, not enough simply means not enough. Not enough money to meet expenses. Not enough jobs available to keep the population gainfully employed, not enough water and food to go around, not enough resources to take care of all the people who are now landing on our shores. Someone, maybe a lot of people, will have to do without. Surely if we trust the news media, then our world is one of profound scarcity, and nothing in our experience would indicate that Jesus or anyone else could possibly make something out of nothing, or at least out of very little. Now we also might, as some do, look to this story from the point of view of a thinly veiled allegory. Jesus didn't really multiply anything, but rather he did get everyone to share what they had. It wasn't just that one little boy, as one of the Gospels tells us, thought to bring lunch. Lots of people brought a few fish and some loaves, and those who had shared with those who did not, and pretty soon everyone had at least a little bit, almost like a kind of Christological stone soup. And it is a nice idea, and not a bad lesson. If you do have, and your neighbor doesn't, it's certainly a good thing to share. But that, after all, is not what our text says. And of the story, were in fact just a parable about sharing, the concept of sharing is sufficiently close to the heart of Jesus' teachings that I suspect he would have made this clear without resorting to some kind of veneer of the miraculous. Instead, our text tells us that the crowds, after having come to Jesus and having their sick healed by him, and prior to that, after walking some great distance around the Sea of Galilee to find him, they were very hungry. If they had brought any food, it had surely already been consumed somewhere along the walk. The disciples sensed the unrest. Or maybe they themselves are starting to get hungry and assume everyone else is too. They are concerned. Perhaps concerned out of compassion but also perhaps inherently knowing that a hungry crowd can become a dangerous and unwieldy thing. Jesus, they might have said, it's late. Please send these folks home before things turn ugly. 
the text reminds us, then after Jesus tells them that they are to feed these people rather than sending them off to purchase food, and after they succeed in doing so to the point where everyone is satisfied, there is a very large abundance left over. Now, beyond looking at this story, should we finally decide to trust its veracity and saying, oh well, Jesus was the Son of God, so he could do anything, and that's certainly nice. Let us see if we can gain some understanding and discover some application for our lives today. It might be helpful to place this story in context. If we go back to the beginning of the 14th chapter of Matthew, we will see that word of John the Baptist's cruel and pointless death reaches Jesus. And Jesus, in turn, reacts the way many of us might when we hear about the untimely death of a friend or relative. He seeks some time alone. We are told he gets into a boat and goes to what is described as a desolate place. From the Gospels, we know that Jesus not infrequently sought refuge with his Abba alone. Time, perhaps, to reflect maybe simply to abide in the presence of God. Many have made much of Jesus' propensity to seek quiet time, and indeed, it's more than likely that this is an excellent practice to emulate. If Jesus needed to pray and meditate and simply be still in the presence of God, how much more should we recognize this need in ourselves? It seems, however, that Jesus' solitude is short-lived. The crowds, who by now know at least a little of what Jesus can do, are hungry, not just for bread, but it seems for more of what he has to say and more of what he can do. So when they arrive, he heals them. And in and of itself, that's a minor principle we may glean from this text. Just a little bit of wisdom placed before our eyes, even before we get to the main event. Jesus, literally the soul of compassion, is surely grieved by the senseless killing of his cousin John at the hands of Herod. But Jesus chooses to respond to death with life. Jesus understands that the antidote, as it were, to death is life. Where death has encroached, or in this case been imposed, the way to battle against death is to sow the seeds of life. And so he does, healing the sick among those who had followed him, followed him after all, because in deepest truth there was literally nothing better for them to do. And we know what happens next. This business of healing goes on for some time. Perhaps the crowds are already wearied from their journey. We are told that they have now grown hungry. But when the disciples suggest they need to go and fend for themselves, Jesus simply won't hear of it. If they are hungry, then feed them, says Jesus. And one can imagine the expression on his disciples' faces. Surely you jest. I mean, healing people, now that's one thing. But feeding all of these people? My whole salary for a year wouldn't feed this many people. And here I might as well confess that if I had been there, I might have said the very same thing. Of course, I'd like to think I wouldn't have, but then I know I probably would have. You see, I, like just about every other human being, have been trained to believe that resources are finite. There really isn't enough to go around. That is why we lock up our possessions. Out of fear, someone will take or damage them, and then we won't be able to get any more. Or so it seems to us. If I'm walking home with my pay stashed away in my pocket, and someone robs me and takes my money, I will, if I am unable to catch the thief, have to work more to replace what has been stolen. And in the meantime, 
Unless I have a surplus saved up somewhere, I will surely have to do without. So the experience of our lives teaches us. And that might be the next thing we want to examine, the difference between Jesus' perspective and our own. Jesus looks at the world his Abba made and sees only abundance. Jesus knows we all have everything we need, and there is at least enough to go around. But we, like those disciples, see only scarcity, and our response lies somewhere between panic and parsimony. Of course, it has to be easy to see abundance when you know you can transform what is effectively a child's bag lunch into a feast for thousands of hungry people. But we may still apply the principle to our own lives, for the call still goes out. Are they hungry? Then for heaven's sake, you give them something to eat. And we still tend to say, but we can't. There's not enough. And here we'd be well served by just a little bit of Jesus' vision. We don't necessarily need his abilities, although it would certainly be nice. We speak of scarcity. But this is something that Jesus, although he lived the life often like that of a mendicant, never considered. Do we really believe that God, in God's wisdom, would make a world that cannot sustain its creatures? Psalm 145 reminds us, the eyes of all look to God, and God gives them their food in due season. Abba opens his hand and satisfies the desires of every living thing. God is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. If there is scarcity, it is not because there is not enough to go around. It is, as unpopular as it may be to say, because some have far, far too much, and many have not nearly enough. By the way, if you have access to the internet and a computer and speak English, there is a significant chance that you, like me, need to be counted in comparison to much of the world's population as one of the ones who has way too much. Now, if we do likely have enough, far more than enough, and we look to heaven and say, Oh God, please do something about the poverty. Please do something about the children who are dying in this place or that. Please do something about the refugees who have no home and who are starving over there. Why don't you do something about that homeless guy, the one with a sign who stands by the side of the road? You know, the sign that reads, We'll work for food. If we make cries like that, cries that sound very much in spirits, a lot like, Jesus, please tell these hungry people to go away. They're making us nervous. If that is what we do, I would suggest the response remains the same. You give them something to eat. Of course that's not easy. Not easy to change our view of society and its supposedly proper order. Not easy to get past our fear that we ourselves will run out of resources. But then consider the disciples, with their five loaves of bread and two fish between them, as they set out to feed a town's worth of tired, dusty people. Surely we have more than a few loaves and a couple of fish. Surely we can find the faith in our Lord to believe that there really will be enough for everyone, if only we can, like the little child from one of the other gospel accounts of this story, loose our grasp on what we believe to be ours. Well, the disciples, I assume with pounding hearts and sweating palms, began to distribute and here, please note, the text does not say that there was just enough for everyone to get by on. 
Instead, we read that there were, in fact, 12 baskets of leftover food. From scarcity to abundance. For God doesn't want us to just get by. Jesus reminds us that he wants us to have, has in fact come, that we may have life in abundance. So it can be in our world, as we learn to trust that God has indeed made enough for all, and that we as stewards of his creation must learn in faith and trust and ultimately enjoy how to give the hungry what they need to eat. Just a final thought on this. I believe that when we see a detailed scripture, it is most likely there for a reason. I suppose we can make too much of details, and I think many people have certainly got hung up on numbers, for example, and their symbolism. But let me suggest this. We are told there are 12 baskets full of leftovers, of broken pieces, as it were. That makes sense. Twelve disciples. Each one is going to grab the basket and start collecting the leftovers. But consider this. The source of this miraculous meal was God. Jesus gave thanks over that meal, as meager as it was at the onset, knowing that all comes from God, the God of abundance. And now each of the servers, each disciple, has a rich basket of food, but the source, the one from whom the blessing derives, is himself empty, for there is no basket present for Jesus. And so if Jesus himself is to be fed, it's the disciples who must feed him out of what he has first given to them and all the other people. It's a kind of cycle, isn't it? A cycle of abundance as opposed to a cycle of poverty. God gives to us so we may give to others, and in doing so, give back to God. Now, I suppose the disciples could have each squirreled away their basket of food out of fear that they might run out and go hungry. But after what they had seen and participated in, I would like to believe that as the now satisfied crowds were slowly going home to tell their friends and neighbors all they had seen, the disciples sat down with Jesus with smiles on their faces and laughter in their hearts and shared a hearty meal. May we as well find new and bold ways to share with our crowds and thus give back to Jesus. Thank you.